From the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis, this is Indiana Issues. Here's your host, Abdul Hakeem Shabazz. Hello and welcome to Indiana Issues. I'm Abdul Hakeem Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndyPolitics.org. Very happy to have you here today with our guests as we come to you from the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. Richard Luger laid to rest the 2019 primary results, new polling data regarding Pete Buttigieg's presidential bid, and of course Donald Trump trade and tariffs and our predictions. Just the things we'll be talking about on today's show. We're joined uh, by our political panel. Uh, we're joined by Lindsay uh, Marie, uh, Libertarian commentator. Lindsay, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Our Democratic friend, Lindsay Ships. Only two Lindsays on the program. <laughs> Program this time, so easy to keep track of. Right, Lindsay, thank you for joining us. Our veteran reporter, Mary Beth Schneider, the State House file. Mary Beth, thank you for being with us. You're welcome. And new uh, to the Indiana Issues family, uh, our good friend April Gregory, uh, conservative podcaster. April, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Richard Luger uh, laid to rest this week, uh, being remembered as an American statesman, changed the lives of millions. Uh, for the better, whether it was uh, nuclear proliferation uh, as a U.S. senator and even the uh, instituting the school lunch program as a member of the IPS uh, school board uh, many years ago, a two and a half hour service, a sort of bipartisan who's who of Washington legends. Uh, Mary Beth, let me start with you. Uh, what can we learn from the homage that was paid to Dick Luger this past week? Um, well, one, that politics has changed an awful lot and not in a good way. Um, Dick Luger represented both intelligence and civility. Um, he, I think it was Sam Nunn that said, you know, the Democrat senator, they worked on nuclear issues together, that Dick Luger never sacrificed his principles, but that didn't stop him from reaching out to the other side, trying to find um, common cause and commonality. Um, it, it was it was a very really moving funeral. Uh, Mitch Daniels gave a marvelous um, eulogy for the man. So did the sons that gave a more personal side of him, but you really saw, um, I don't think you know, there are too many people in politics who would have that many people from both sides of the aisle saying, this is a great man. Uh, April, when we look at uh, Dick Luger's legacy, and like I said, the fact like Mary Beth said, you know, so many people, Democrats, Republicans, uh, came to pay uh, homage tribute, uh, is that era of politics officially now gone, or can we get some of it back? Well, I'm not sure that it was all entirely what we're making it out to be. Certainly Luger was what he was, but that doesn't mean every other politician was that way too. There has been fighting over the years, and this is not just new to the past couple years or whatever. So certainly he was his own special class of, of politician and, and person, and there are still other people like that out there, but as a whole, no, we're not, all the politicians are not going to be Lugers. Um, is it, what does that say, uh, Lindsay uh, Ships? Do we sort of sometimes maybe sort of romanticize a little bit, you know, about these sort of bygone errors? You know, we, we see this, you know, like, you know, statesly men and women in oratory, but if you really go back, what was it, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, the half-breed hermaphrodite squaw, hey, Grover Cleveland, where's your baby, that sort of thing? I think it's really easy to romanticize Senator Luger because he was just such a great, he is, in the words of Joe Hogg said, uh, or whomever you believe was quoted, uh, he is for the ages now. And, you know, I think that is truly, uh, that is, tr that truly encompasses his work. Uh, it's hard to be a single issue person when you're talking about Dick Luger. He just came, he came down to, uh, to the, the weeds and worked in the weeds for, for any Hoosier who needed it. So it was really, um, as a D it was, as a Democrat, it was, um, it was a hard day to watch, to watch a standard bearer go and to say goodbye to him. Um, uh, but I know there's a lot of differing <laughs> viewpoints on that. Uh, Lindsay, uh, Marie, uh, what would you say about Dick Luger's impact on Indiana? I think the one thing, I mean, obviously his um, funeral kind of showed just how the impact he had and how many people came out um, and how authentic their speeches were. A lot of times we see politicians just going through, mm -hmm. you know, um, the emotions and saying the typical things. But that's not what we saw. I think he was one of the last Rockefeller Republicans. And on the the left, we also see we don't really have many blue dog Democrats left. It's sort of a sign of the times that things are changing. And if you are those types of people, it's very hard to get elected nowadays. Um, but he was one of the last good ones. Um, just looking at uh, Indiana specifically, like I said, not not to take away anything from the, what the senator did at the national level, just real quick around the table before we go to the next topic. Uh, Mary Beth, what would you say Dick Luger's biggest impact on the state of Indiana was? 
Well, I'm going to give two things. One of them is that he really did start the renaissance of this city. And the, you look around, Market Square Arena isn't there anymore, but if Market Square Arena had never been built, you wouldn't have all the other things that we celebrate today. The second thing is actually something that did not get mentioned, kind of to my surprise, at the funeral. He played a, and uh, still continues to play a really key role in getting more women involved, especially in Republican politics. And um, it has been dominated by men, but um, there are women in all sorts of offices and sitting in office that are there because Dick Luger had the Luger series. Uh, April, what would you say Dick Luger's biggest impact here in Indiana was? Um, just the way he, you know, executed the bold leadership and made the decisions and did what was best for the city and for our state and national levels. Lindsay Ships? I would have to say school lunch. Uh, it was just, um, you know, right out of the the bat on school nutrition and SNAP and other programs, uh, the the anti hunger community immediately felt his loss, and they and they felt it so strongly because he was such an advocate for those programs, and so uh, involved in the farm bills. Um, just since he was on Senate Ag, he was Senate Ag. I mean, he was yeah. Senate Agriculture. That was who. It, Senate agriculture was. If you if it didn't have uh, Senator Luger's support, it wasn't going to happen. And um, that that goes to say for the all of the school nutrition programs, which still to this day have been set a very high bar. Liz Murray? I think it's simple. He put principles over party, and we do not see that hardly anymore, and it's a shame. You're watching Indiana Issues. I'm your host, Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndyPolitics.org. Our guests today are Libertarian Lindsay Marie, or Democrat Lindsay Ships, Mary Beth Schneider, uh, the State House File, and uh, conservative podcaster April Gregory. Uh, who just went to the polls uh, this past couple of weeks uh, to pick Republicans and Democrats? They want to represent them uh, in the Indiana primary, uh, with a few exceptions, not a whole lot of surprises. Uh, Mary Beth, starting with you. Um, like I said, not a whole lot of surprises in the primary, but I guess it brings up an even bigger question. Do we even need municipal primaries? Well, I think it would help if they didn't, didn't do slating. I've never liked slating. <laughs> I think that this should not be up to a bunch of pre I think you're about to get a big men. giant high five from everybody <laughs> on the <this laughs> yeah. table. <laughs> and so and have a real contest, you know, if there's um, – truly no, you know, no real choice, why would a voters even go? And it was reflected in the numbers, which actually it's the numbers I find interesting more than the outcome. And I, um, I think it shows that Jim Merritt, the Republican nominee for mayor, has work cut out for him because, and I was surprised by this, he only had 14,000 votes. Joe Hoxett had 28,000 votes. Now, those are pitiful numbers for a city the size of Indianapolis, but I it, it, it's your chance to show some organizational strength. And I know it's difficult when, you know, for someone like Merritt, who had the legislative session right up to the end of when the primary is, but um, I think Republicans are going to have to do better at getting their voters out. But also, and anybody feel free to jump in, I think uh, Merritt County was kind of a, a weird creature in itself because, yes, it was a municipal primary, and turnout was only about 9%. But on the Democratic side, you had like nine contested city right. county council races where on the Republican side, I think it was just sort of one on the south side. And does that sort of, you know, in the, in the bigger scheme of things, more contests seem to drive more turnout? I'll let anybody. Right. Turn. Yeah, I think a lot of it played into that fact that you just pointed out that there were more contested council races. And so those are going to drive uh, turnout. Um, and, and it was for the Democrats. Um and, you know, just like Mary Beth said, it's kind of just sad how few people are heading to the polls on both sides. Um, but at the same time, you know, Merritt is the new candidate. He's not the incumbent. He just finished the legislative session. So his campaign is now going to be hitting the ground harder, full time every day. And it's going to be different in the general. I think he's got a lot stacked up against him, too. You know, you've got a, a very, very strong candidate in Joe Hogsett who has a lot of um, obviously advantages of being the incumbent and and a lot of other things working for him but um, merit more than anything I think he's I, I think he's got a lot of work cut out for him just from the pure standpoint of being behind uh, he started out behind in the money race he's uh, naturally going to be behind in simply the numbers game here in Marion County so uh, you know he's definitely a David versus Goliath right now uh, something I thought was interesting um, 
and it was it was. I mean, we talk about uh, incumbents and not a whole lot of surprises. Uh, one surprise there was was the mayor's race up in Gary. You know, longtime mayor Karen Freeman uh, losing uh, one stage like the the county the Lake County auditor. Uh, that's Democrat country. And in the time since the primary, have you been able to figure out what exactly happened up there? I think people were ready for change. You know, Karen's been there for a good long time. And uh, there's been a lot of drama in Lake County in politics in the past 10 years. Um, Democrats or Republicans, I'll leave it to y'all to decide. But um, it clearly is on both sides of the aisle. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you've had uh, lots of just lots of drama. Um, you've had folks arrested. You've had you've had folks indicted left and right. And so it's been a very interesting race uh, to watch, an interesting county to watch. But I don't think many downstate folks had this race called for for the opponent at all. Um, forgive me, the name was Jerome. Yeah, I can't remember last his name. last name. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but in any case, uh, I don't think many people had Karen pegged as the in the losing column this time around. Oh. Lindsay Marie, let me ask you, because you spend a lot of time in southern Indiana, any surprises, you know, Evansville or along the Ohio River, but just pretty much the status quo, just like everywhere else in Indiana? Pretty much. I think the biggest surprise is they're actually starting to release some numbers of how much taxpayer dollars are going to these things. Um, they spend about $240,000 on the primaries, in which I, as a libertarian, take huge issue with, because as a libertarian, I cannot legally vote in the primary because the majority of the candidates I vote for are not Republicans or Democrats. And so... Basically, we have the government um, going ahead and using taxpayer dollars and creating a public institution for two private institutions that should be doing it on their own. I don't understand why Republicans and Democrats can't have nominating conventions just like libertarians do. We don't use taxpayers' money to do it. We do it on our own dime. So I don't think I should have to pay for everyone else to have theirs. I don't disagree, but I don't see it changing but very much. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It's not going to change. But. <laughs> well, let me ask you about that, Mary Beth, because you covered a lot of elections. Mm-hmm. I always thought it was fascinating that uh, in the state of Indiana, we have a municipal primary. Then you've got June, July, August, September, October, almost six months uh, to a mayor's race. Meanwhile, just 160 miles up the road in my hometown of Chicago, not that I want to use a Chicago election for anything necessarily as a standard bearer, but you have a primary six weeks later. You've got a general election. You've got a mayor for a city of 3 million people, and we're done. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't think that'll ever change either, but it, it's not a bad idea. I mean, I think um, another solution would be skip the municipal year, but I know they don't want to do that because then you get um, so overlooked with the presidential race mm-hmm. or a Senate race. Um, I think this is just how it's going to be. I'm not actually in favor of nominating conventions because it's one more way to cut out people. And if I don't like slating, I'm not going to really like, you know, them picking the whole shebang. So. But how many people are really showing up? We're talking about low voter yeah, turnout. That's problem. So the people, at, if you go to libertarian conventions, there's thousands and thousands of people that Give go. people a choice, and I think they'll come out. If we want to These talk weren't about real choices. I know some yes. of those were contested, but that's they true. were, you know, an incumbent versus some goofball, you know, who's getting <laughs> 200 not, votes. I understand <laughs> the choice, but it's not like it's November where it's the real election. This is literally two parties who can't figure out their own internal issues. If you do want more people voting, though, we need to make it easier to vote. But, but in this case, didn't we just do that, uh, particularly uh, in Mary County, sort of adopting the vote center <laughs> strategy? And that's what I thought was really sort of the, uh, the unspoken story of this. There are actually, you know, you could vote anywhere in Mary County, just like you have vote centers up in Hamilton County and other places. But the turnout was still only about 9%. So does it once again boil down to is it candidates and issues that drive turnout as opposed to, you know, logistically speaking, because it, if you look back at the 2018 midterms, what we saw were a lot of races sort of being, people come out early and v- voting early, but not necessarily big increases in numbers, per se. I think they need to do a uh, better job next time of promoting the vote centers, because those were new. I didn't even realize until the day before the election that I could vote anywhere yeah. on the primary day. You're not the only person and, I've heard that from. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm plugged in, and I should know. I should have known that. And uh, it, so, I think when there's more uh, publicity about that, and the word gets out better, that could possibly make it easier. Because if you can vote on the way home from work, as opposed right. to 
trying to do it by your house and uh, scram to your polling place. Right, you can do it. Yeah, exactly. I know that the uh, the clerk, my elder, elder, I think she did a great job this past election. Uh, I know the turnout was down. Uh, I think that would have happened whether you had uh, new fancy poll books or traditional old school uh, elections. So I think it was a, a good election, and I'd like to see more counties take that that route. The Tippecanoe, Hamilton, Marion have now. All right. You are watching Indiana Issues. Uh, we're talking about uh, all things Indiana politics. We're going to take ourselves a quick break. When we come back, uh, new polling data. How does that impact Pete Buttigieg and his presidential aspirations, particularly here in the state of Indiana, and Donald Trump, China, and trade and tariff wars? You're watching Indiana Issues. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Indiana Issues. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of MindyPolitics.org. Today, we are talking about a number of political issues affecting the great state of Indiana. Our panel is Libertarian Lindsay Marie, Democrat Lindsay Ships, Mary Beth Schneider of the State House File, and conservative podcaster April Gregory. Well, a new poll out of registered voters uh, with respect to the presidential race showing South Bend made a Pete Buttigieg coming in third. Uh, here in the state of Indiana, after Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, we can get those numbers up on the screen. You can see uh, Joe Biden, 33 percent, Bernie Sanders, 23, uh, Pete Buttigieg, 20. Uh, this was a We Ask America survey. Uh, those were Democrats, a subsection of 800 registered voters uh, here in the state of Indiana. Uh, Lindsay Ships, let me start with you. Uh, is that good news or bad news for Pete Buttigieg about a year or so before the May primary in Indiana? I think it's nothing but good news. I, I think I could only have been so hopeful as Pete Buttigieg to be in that top three. Uh, so I think it's great news for him, and I hope he continues the momentum. Uh, I know he's got talented staff. Liz is great people and knows exactly what she's doing, so I don't see this changing at all. And he's been bringing on a lot of Obama yeah. staff, too. That's true. Obama staff. Yeah, so. that, yeah, that news this morning mm-hmm. as well. So I think we'll see some exciting exciting switcheroos up in that that percentage. April Gregory, uh, Republicans, uh, sort of tongue in cheek, once those poll numbers came out, said Pete Buttigieg, you know, is losing to a seventy-something-year-old, you know, former Obama guy and a you know seventy-five-year-old socialist. He should be doing much better in Indiana. Is that just political spin, or is there something to it? No, I mean, I think I think Biden and Sanders are just going to be the standard bearer. Um, heavy or you know the heavyweight, the, the top across the country, just because of what they are. Now, it in a primary, you're going to someone like Buddha Judge or whoever else is going to make a rise and they're going to make a good run. And I don't think a lot of Democrat voters want Sanders or Biden. So my only my only wonder, obviously, Pete is doing great right now, but I just wonder, is he peaking too soon? Um, and it's, you know, it's still so far away. Mary Beth, uh, that 20 for that 20 uh, percent number, like I said, grantedly, it's registered voters. It's a year off from the primary. If you're at the Buddha Judge campaign, are you like saying, OK, we're, we're in third place, but look, we're in third place, too. This is good for us. Yeah, actually, I think it's almost meaningless because, for one thing, Indiana's primary, by the time it comes around to May, the odds of them still being, you know, a a contest, I think it'll be settled before then, even with, I think, what, 22, 23 people in. Or we could have another 2008. um, The one (laughs) that it's perhaps not good for really is Sanders. (laughs) Sanders was on the ballot here before, and so he's a well-known name. He's had lots of attention for all this time, and yet he's only at 23 percent, and there's a whole lot of people who should have been, who probably voted for him last time, meant they were going somewhere else. It's also margin of error stuff. 
It's this poll had a three and a half percent margin of error. So he's basically tied with a man that most people in the poll couldn't even tell you who he was. And the other problem for Sanders is that if you look at the New Hampshire polls, Iowa polls, he's actually not doing that great. Elizabeth Warren's on the rise. Mm -hmm. Pete Buttigieg is hanging in there. And Biden is leading. And when you, um, the, the adage about both Iowa and New Hampshire has been there are only three tickets. And if Buttigieg has one of those tickets, he's in great shape. This also doesn't take into account money. And so on the list that you've got there, Biden and uh, Buttigieg, they've, they've got cash, but it's really, I mean, it's Biden who's leading in the money game. So that's going to make a huge difference. And these polling numbers are great, 33. You know, those are great big pop to have. Um, but you've also got uh, in Iowa, you've got Amy Klobuchar, who has a huge lead, she, a known factor out there. The name is familiar. Lindsay, yeah. uh, but this, uh, but these numbers that we just saw, uh, if you're Pete Buttigieg, are you, are you excited but still going to temper your enthusiasm? A little bit. I mean, but it's my home state, right? So I'd be, <laughs> I'd hope I'd be pulling better than that. Um, but the thing is, I think it's way too early to t like take any of this into consideration. A year before the presidential election in 2016, everyone was laughing at Trump. I was mm -hmm. probably pulling out like 3% or something, right? And look what happened. So exactly. you never really know what's going to happen until election night. Well, let's take a look at something that may give us a little bit of a clue what we could be seeing down the road. Uh, that same poll uh, did approval, disapproval ratings of various figures uh, here in Indiana. Donald Trump, 46% approval. Mike Pence, 47 Eric Holcomb, 54 uh, Pete Buttigieg, 35 And the Attorney General, Curtis Hill, uh, who will also be on the ballot next year, only 13% approval, but 60% after all the news still have basically no opinion. And by the way, uh, another one poll tab, but one detail we did go into uh, was that 45% of this came out of uh, the Indianapolis area. Uh, what can we gather from, you know, those numbers up there. Does the Trump train still work in Indiana? Is Eric Holcomb going to be fine? Trump train definitely works in Indiana. I mean, it's it's no, it's from my perspective, I, d I don't see how uh, how Indiana, I know Indiana still is seen nationally as in play. So I don't want to take away from anyone's ability to to achieve, you know, what Barack Obama did in 2008. But I really do think that we've got uh, we've got a Trump state again for 2000, uh, 2020. I think the one thing that still I preach about is that no one knows who Curtis Hill is. I yes. mean, yeah, that's what so we talk about it all the time because we're in the thick of it. But people even in Indianapolis apparently don't know who right. he is. Right. And, and also you, you can see at the poll they don't know who Pete Buttigieg is either. So that can work in his favor or it can work against him as people start finding out more of his policies because he doesn't often talk about them. I think a lot of people are just uh, kind of over all the buzz and all the media and all the oh my gosh every day it's something else and it's like I just need a break from politics for a minute and then we're going to start paying attention in a few months to, to the, yeah. the election and see what's going on. Mary Beth, let me get your thoughts. Um, I don't think it's actually such great news for Donald Trump. I It's not that he won't win Indiana, but you would expect him to be over 50 percent here and it's a reflection I think of what you're seeing nationwide. There was a poll that came out with all the head-to-heads and uh I think it was he Joe lost Biden. to everybody, with the exception of Pete Buttigieg, where Pete was only one percentage point down. Mm -hmm. And his uh, nationwide, Trump couldn't do better than 41 percent on a single person. And Biden was killing him. And then the other thing I noticed about the poll is great news for Eric Holcomb. Yeah, I think that's he should feel very comfortable going in. To, uh, 2020. And also, uh, just real quick, we throw this up on the, the screen here before we jump to our next topic. Uh, Eric Holcomb's 54% uh, uh, thought he should be uh, reelected, while 20% said no. And I think that 20% are probably evenly split between some hardcore Republicans and some hardcore uh, Democrats. 77% uh, support a raise in legal age to purchase tobacco to 21, something that's been on Senator Todd Young's uh, agenda. And 39% think the nation on the right track, but 50% feel better about Indiana. Once again, Mary Beth. Is that 54 and 50 bode well for Eric Holcomb oh, as they yeah. get ready to walk into next year? Absolutely. There's in, n Any politician would love those numbers. There's always going to be people who are unhappy about something. But you're over 50 percent. You're doing good. Uh, well, let's jump on to our next one because something that could play a big role in next year, the issue of trade and tariffs. Uh, as we have record this program, the U.S. and China continue to be in the middle of a trade war with tariffs being thrown on hundreds of billions of dollars worth of goods and services. The president saying these are needed to get a better trade deal. Uh, the Chinese in saying that the American economy is healthy enough 
uh, that it can afford it. Uh, but, Lindsay, I remember having a conversation with you at a forum recently uh, about the research trip you made up to Wisconsin. Uh, it's a little bit of a different story depending on where you are. Sure. I, mean, I think this question all depends on, OK, what sector are we talking about? Uh, but when we're in Indiana, I think it's really important we pay attention to the agriculture sector. And we saw how the soybean uh, issue continues to be still to this day where we were talking about it nitty gritty back in the summer of 2018. It's still an issue here that we haven't forgotten about. we got a lot of soybean farmers here and we've seen how these uh, these tariffs have really impacted folks on on, on the the, the farm level here in Indiana, that same thing is happening in Wisconsin with dairy farmers. And that com- industry has completely fallen out underneath itself. And so I think uh, when you're talking farm bill, uh, in terms of, of how this, um, and I know farm bill was last year, but when we're talking about these issues with ag, we have to talk about how tariffs affect farmers. And they're not positive about the tariffs. They're not positive about Trump. And uh, we'll see how they, they, they migrate those issues down here. See how um, they start talking about it. Um, can this... Uh, Real quick before we go to our last topic, can Indiana survive a trade war? So, you know, this is a state that relies so heavily on trade and exports as part of its economy. Absolutely not. We've already seen in southern Indiana in um, Al- Alcoa, they last year half their stock out the door. They have to go ahead and get steel and aluminum from Canada for some of the stuff that they're making, and they were paying 10% tariffs on it. Um, they filed for an exemption in March of last year, and the, the department has still not said anything back to them. If it continues as is, they're going to have to start laying people off sooner than later. Yeah, and the farmers aren't just losing current sales. They're losing sales for years to come as people who were buying Indiana soybeans have had to find other places like Brazil to buy them from. So this is um, not affecting just their current income. This could be the difference between still having your family farm in five years. April, let me get uh, – because there are a lot of people who are uh, big supporters of the president saying, hey – we, we understand this is going to be painful, but at the end of the day, this is going to be a good thing because America will walk away uh, with a better trade deal. Is that you know, good optimism or just wishful thinking? No, I, I think obviously we've had issues with China for a long time now, and he's finally tackling those issues. So um, by doing this, he is going to bring them to the table, and they're, they're starting to come to the table. And there is potential now for change to happen because he's finally doing something. Is this going to have a, real quickly, our political impact on next year? A hundred percent. Yes. I think that people are going to start to see what's happening. They're going to feel it in their pocketbook and at home. And the other thing is people are going to start learning what tariffs are and what tar- tariff deficits are. It's a normal part of a market. So the idea that we want to close that, if you don't know macroeconomics, it's economic literacy. Like you can't, e- sorry, economic illiteracy. It doesn't make sense. It's not part of a natural market. So when you close it, what are we trying to achieve? It's not that we don't have the deficit because they're screwing us over. It's because we have a growing economy. It's because our currency is strong and we have a very low savings rate. Those and are also, all good things. And also the diplomatic implications of these tariffs discussions. It's uh, something we see uh, across the globe that, that are, are long lasting too. Yeah, And the Indiana Chamber of Commerce came out this week warning that these tariffs were impacting Indiana manufacturers. Yeah, so, already to yeah. like at least a couple hundred million dollars, if I remember uh, the news release. All right, well, we're going to jump real quickly to our predictions and prognostication that we do at the end of every Indiana Issues program. What your audience be paying attention to, or what is your big prediction of the week? And uh, Lindsay Marie, we will start with you. So mine's not quite a prediction, but something I'm watching really closely right now. I'm in the 8th District in Evansville, Indiana, the mayoral race this fall. Um, right now, it's only a two-way race between a Libertarian and a Republican. The Dems have until June 30th to file someone, um, but it seems like they actually might not. We'll see what happens. But uh, the Libertarian has run before in a two-way and had a pretty good strong uh, showing, so it'll be interesting. So the Democrats are taking a pass on Lloyd Winnicky? Well, I don't know. <laughs> they don't have a lot of good contenders down there, to be honest. Um, so to be honest, they might be better off with the Libertarian in office than the Republican. I think you're going to see somebody coming out of the cage, ready to go, screaming and hollering to take on Eric Holcomb. And I... Perhaps Woody Myers? <laughs> Would Rob Kendall? Let's <laughs> <laughs> just say Rob Kendall. <laughs> He's got my vote. I think that <laughs> ship has sailed. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think you'll see somebody, uh, there hasn't been a lot of chit-chat about which D is going to take. I'm not going to say who I think it will be, but uh, I do think you'll see a, a strong, strong contender come out and hold uh, Governor Holcomb accountable for decisions that he made this legislative session. Mary Beth, what are your thoughts? Or what should we pay attention to or your big political prediction? Um, I don't have a big political prediction. Um, what I, I am paying attention to how Pete Buttigieg is doing. I'm, I'm frankly surprised, I have to say. 
you know, because you're the mayor of Little South Bend, you know, and it's sort of funny that you have the mayor of New York get in, and yet <laughs> Pete Buttigieg, in a head-to-head, you know, wipes them out. I, that's got to be annoying for Bill de Blasio, but I don't think there are many people across the country really hoping to have the New York mayor, you know, be president. It reminds, and, it reminds yeah. me of an old joke about Steve Goldsmith saying, when he ran for governor, saying the people who wouldn't vote for him are people who hadn't met him and people who had met him. <laughs> <laughs> April Gregory, give me the last word real quick. Um, I think we need to pay attention to the momentum building on the merit campaign here in Indianapolis. Um, he's hitting the ground running every single day and uh, on the phones, getting donations, and it's going to be a completely different thing because the undercurrent of dissatisfaction with the current mayor is um, – uh, being uh, maybe downplayed or being ignored a little bit. Uh, keep an eye on this summer. A number of resignations to sort of quietly happen uh, in the Holcomb administration as they get ready to sort of build uh, for their reelection campaign. And that is going to do it for this edition of Indiana Issues. Our guests have been uh, Libertarian Lindsey Marie, Democrat Lindsey Ships, Mary Beth Schneider of the State House File, and of course our good friend April Gregory, uh, conservative podcaster. Big special thanks to all our friends here at the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. Thank you for joining us. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndiePolitics.org. We'll talk to you next time on Indiana Issues.